So for those of you that can see on the, the chat, I decided to bring my daughter in just to say hi for our last lecture. Say hi. Hi. Uh, <laughs> there's the, the class is saying hi. Yes, they are. Uh, I'm going to go through the, the lecture notes super quick, and then I'll give everybody time to type in some questions. Um, I want to let everybody know I have here that homework 8.4 is graded. I didn't quite finish it. I've got like um, like five or six more homeworks to grade, uh, and then I will um, I'll, I'll post the grades. I think I went ahead and uploaded the solution. I also uh, uploaded the solution to homework 8.5, so that's um, – so you all ha should have all the solutions, but I'll check after class Yay. to make sure that homework 8.4 solutions posted. Bye. Um, I wanted to make sure everybody remembers the grade distribution. The final's worth 25% in here because exam two was just on bolted and welded connections, so there's not really a lot on it. So columns and beams, though, does take up a fair chunk uh, of the semester. Um, also, I wanted to mention Two of you have not uploaded your course evals. Uh, I, again, I really appreciate the feedback, and I know all of us uh, uh, civil engineering faculty do, because we want to make sure that we're providing the best experience for you possible. Uh, and we, uh, we can't do that without your feedback. And so this is your real chance to let us know, um, you know, any suggestions that you would have or anything that you want to let us know. This is the, uh, uh, the time to do it. Um, Tell you what, uh, let me let me go ahead and take uh, take Stephanie back up. She is crawling around all over the place, and I will um, uh, get to the notes. Give me one minute, I'll be right back. I know the lecture quality has dropped substantially now that now that uh, Stephanie left. Um, let's get into the uh, exam overview. So uh, first off, I wanted to give everybody as much time as possible on the exam, uh, but what I can't do is dip into another exam window. Um, I'll show everybody the same thing that I showed uh, in concrete design. So. This is the uh, exam schedule according to Marshall. And we meet uh, obviously at 11, uh, 11 a.m. or Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So our exam window is 10.15 to 12.15. But I can't go into the next exam window because I know people have class 12.30, you know, Tuesday, Thursday. Uh, so what I did is I said we're going to go from 10.15 until right at the start of the next one. So I'm giving you all as much time as possible. Um, but again, like, like I've said before, I'm not designing this to be a two-hour exam. I'm designing it to be a 50-minute exam, similar to what we do in class. So it's not intended to be a, um, it's not intended to be a, 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 a time crunch. And again, I'll, I'll apply my rule of three like I have in the past. If I get it done in 20 minutes, you should be able to get it done in an hour. And so I'm going to apply that same, uh, that same rule. Um, it's open book and open notes, and so what I mean by that is you can obviously use the steel manual. You kind of have to for uh, for a lot of the, the calculations. You can use any resource on Blackboard, okay? And so what I mean by that is you can use the lecture notes. You can use the homeworks, the homework solutions. You can use the lecture recordings. You can go I, – I have no problem if you, during the exam you go on YouTube and watch the old recording from one of the lectures. That, that, I have no problem with that at all. Just – not anybody else. Just as long as you're not using anybody else, you know, another another classmate or, you know, some online posting from somewhere. Uh, as long as you're not using that, I'm 
perfectly fine with with uh, you, you completing the exam. Um, uh, as for format, it's going to be the same as it always has been for a, a lot of our other lectures. So five short answer questions, three computational problems, again, same format. Um, do me a favor, type out an answer for every question, even the computational problems. So if the answer is 12.3 kips, type out 12.3 kips. It really helps me out with grading. Don't just answer the question on uh, the scratch calculations, type it out. Um, you do need to upload a PDF uh, of your calculations, but everybody by now, that should be old hat. You all know how to do that with cam scanner and whatnot. So I'm gonna move through that uh, pretty quickly. As for what's on this exam, it's columns and beams. So for the columns, I want you to understand basic column buckling theory. So what's the deal with K factors, effective length factors, geometric imperfections, residual stresses, all the, the, the conceptual stuff associated with, uh, with columns. I want you to be able to analyze columns using the two methods we discussed in class, the column curves and table 4.1, and be able to select economical shapes using table 4.1. As for beams, uh, understand basic bending theory, the, the buckling theory, you know, the idea of what, what is a plastic moment, um, what's the elastic neutral axis versus the plastic neutral axis, how do you compute ZX, um, what is lateral torsional buckling, like what even is it, uh, how, what's the deal with moment gradient, you know, how we treated moment as a constant in our solution. Um, and then you need to be able to analyze and design beams that are either continuously braced or discreetly braced. For dis, uh, continuously braced beams, you design using the ZX tables, and then for discreetly braced beams, you design using the beam charts. And then don't forget shears and deflections. Remember, shears have never really ever been a problem, but deflections could be. So be able to assess service live load deflection limits. All right, and then I did the same thing with this slideshow that I did uh, for the concrete design slideshow. I put all of the relevant formulas and procedures and equations in one place. And so the slideshow is a little long, but it's all here, all in one spot. So column analysis. Method one is to use the column curve, to use the equation. So you determine your largest KL over R, you compute FE using the largest KL over R, then you compute your F critical, and then you compute VPN, 0.9 F critical AG. And remember, F critical is either this uh, 0.658 raised to the Fy over Fe um, times Fy, or 0.877 Fe. And remember, the difference is whether or not your slenderness is less than or greater than that limiting value of 4.71 squared of E over Fy. Um, as for uh, the second method of analysis, we use table 4.1. Remember, 4.1a is the one for 50 KSI. We never really used 4.1b and 4.1c, but you can. It's the same thing. It's just they're for different yield stresses, so make sure you're using the right one. Uh, if KLX is less than or equal to KLY, just look up the capacity. If KLX is bigger than KLY, then you look up the capacity based on whichever's bigger, KLY or KL effective. And so you use that KXLX over RXRY. Uh, there's a good chance you're going to need to linearly interpolate, so don't forget the expression for linear interpolation. For design, uh, step one, you determine your factored load, determine the largest KL uh, X and the KL Y for the column. Based on KL Y, select a trial group. So remember you pick at least W1, 1 W14, 1 W12, 1 W10, 1 W8. It's possible that you might have a situation where maybe there's a W8 that doesn't work or maybe even a W10 that doesn't work. Um, just pick the ones that you can. For each of the trial shapes, then what you do, organize them by weight. Um, if KX, if KLX is less than KLY, just pick the lightest one and there you go. If KLX is bigger, go through the, the KXLX check for each one and for all the ones that work, select the lightest one. The ones, when it's all kit and caboodle, when it's all said and done, make sure you use method one to analyze that column to make sure that it works because uh, you're designing based off method two, so analyze with the other method to make sure everything's hunky-dory. MP and ZX. Remember, MP is a pretty straightforward calculation. We just take FY times ZX. And ZX is, so we sum the area, uh, so it's the area times the moment arm from the plastic neutral axis. Remember, the elastic neutral axis is where the centroid is. The plastic neutral axis is where the area above equals the area below. 
Uh, we always take those terms to be positive uh, in our expression. Um, what I did here in the slideshow is instead of getting into analysis and design procedures for beams, I wanted to include the three main references that you need to have tabbed for beams. Table 3.2, which is the ZX charts, Table 3.3, which is the IX tables, and Table 3.10, which is our LTB curve, our, our beam charts. Um, uh, so there's really not a whole lot on this slide that you probably don't already know, but uh, everything's, those are the three guides that you need. And then I have a step-by-step -step process for continuously braced beam design. So we compute our factored moment, compute our required moment of inertia. Uh, and then we go into table three, two, pick the bold row, the one that's uh, the first bold row that works. And then for that bolded row section, if the IX is fine, then move on. Otherwise, go to table three, three and select a new section. Once you've gotten past step three and step four, analyze that section to verify its capacity. And that's a good habit regardless of if you're doing continuously braced design or discreetly braced design. Once you have a trial shape, analyze it. Make sure it works, okay? Um, I have the uh, moment gradient modifier, the CB term, all the values and terms associated with that. The arguably one of the most important slides for beams is the LTB curve, uh, the AISC LTB curve, just the flow chart to determine the capacity for a discreetly braced beam. Um, and then our discreetly braced beam uh, uh, selection process. And the only thing that's really different is instead of going into table 3.2, you're going into table 3.10, you're going into the beam chart. You got a little bit more to deal with because you got CB, but all in all, a lot of the process is very similar. Um, if you have a high CB term, uh, well, sorry, and then, then, you know, select your section, verify the capacity. If you have a high CB term, remember, you might have to iterate through table 310 a bit and just, you know, select a section, look up its VMP, select a section, look up its VMP. Once you get a VMP higher than MU, then analyze that section. Don't waste your time on all the ones that you know aren't going to work. That is the exam in a nutshell. I am now going to turn it over to you. Whatever questions you might have, the floor is yours. Um, the only thing I'd ask is if you want me to do any like workout problems or go through a solution like I can, but let, if there's any short questions, if there's something I can answer quickly, let's get through those first because I want to make sure we're getting through as many questions as possible. But with that, I'm going to shut up. The floor is yours. Okay, so you're asking about when you go to table 3-2, why is it that we look, that sometimes do we look at the bolded rows and sometimes we don't? Is that, in a nutshell, what you're asking? Okay, so here's the, the best answer I can give that's descriptive and brief. When you're doing continuously braced beam design, you don't care about buckling. You just care about MP. So when you're looking at a continuously braced beam, you pick the bold row any day of the week, all the time. 
The issue is on discreetly braced beams. So what determines which is the most effective solution for a discreetly braced beam is that LTB chart. And so let's let's talk about the bold row situation for a sec. So in this in table three two, what the manual did is it sorted all the sections by ZX and then it groups them and the bold row is the one that's the lightest within that group that has it's the lightest within that group. Okay. But you're picking it because within that group, not only is it the lightest, but it's the one that has the largest capacity. So, so the way to think about it is table three, two, each of those groups, the bold row is the lightest one that has the largest capacity. Well, in the beam charts, the solid line curve is the lightest section in that range, in that region that has the largest capacity. So that region, in that region, the solid line is the one that's the lightest that has the largest capacity. But because you're talking about the beam charts, the solid line section in table 310 doesn't always match the bold section in table 3.2. So that's why that happens. The, 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 the real short answer is for continuously braced beams, go off the bold row in table 3.2. For discreetly braced beams, go off of the solid line curve in table 3.10. They're just not always the same. And, and there's no real simple answer for why. It's just because, remember, each curve, each beam has its own unique curve. And so, all those solid line sections are just looking at that region and saying which one's the one on top. And it's not always the bold rows in the ZX curve or in the ZX tables. It's just the equations are really complicated. So sometimes one member is over top another. If we have two different types of loading on a simply supported beam, is there a way to use table 3.1 for CB or would you simply cut a section in some moments? That's a great question. And here's the, the short answer. Um, you can use table 3.1 if the other load is just the beam self-weight. And let me let me expand on that a bit. I'm not saying that beam self-weight is negligent. I mean, the beam has to hold it. Computing MU. However, if you have a beam, for instance, that has like a point load at mid span, that's like 60 kips, and then it's self-weight, and that's it. In that scenario, go ahead and use table 3.1 for, for CB because that self-weight, while you, you can't neglect it you, for, for MU, you cannot worry about it for determining CB. What will happen is it will affect CB, but very, very, very little. So like one of our last homework assignments, there was a segment where CB is 1, and if you use, the central, if you use table 3.1, it tells you CB is 1. But if you actually do what you're suggesting, Logan, and cut a section and write out the equations, CB comes out to be like 1.007 or something like that. It has a very, very small effect on CB. Um, so if, so to be clear, if the other load, if, it, if you say two different types of loading and one of them is the self-weight, just use table 3.1. Now, what if it's not self-weight? What if it's, what if you have a beam that has like a point load at mid span and it's got, like two kips per foot in dead load. Well, the short answer is no, you can't use table 3.1. You gotta go through and chug that thing out. But you can use table 3.1 as a little bit of a guide to make sure that your math is coming out correctly. Let me kind of explain. Um, give me a second. Let me pull up the manual and I'll, and I'll show you what I mean. Give me a second. I have to log in, so give me one second.
while I'm logging in, if anybody else has any other questions, please don't don't hesitate. Um, but let me log into the manual and and show you what's going on. All right. Uh, All right, let's let's pull this up. Um, okay, so this is table three one. This is the values of CB for simply for beams, and I'm going to use two cases for discussion. Okay, first one I want to use is this this top one right here. So I want to make sure that we're only looking at one. Um, let's say we're looking at this one. Okay. So it's a point load at mid span and there's bracing at the ends and at the load point. Okay. So everybody should see that the CB value is 1.67. Okay. Now what I want to do is I want to look at, uh, this case right here, the one on the very, very bottom. So this is a case with a distributed load but the bracings are at the end of, and at mid-span. And for this case, CB is 1.3. So does everybody see how for the distributed load it's 1.3, but for the point load it's 1.67? Well, what I can pretty much tell you is if you have a scenario that uh, is akin to what uh, Logan is suggesting where you have distributed load and a point load, what I can tell you is you're gonna have to compute the CB value, but it'll probably be between those values. Like, if you're getting a CB value that's 2.9, you did something wrong. You, you have a calculation error somewhere, and you need to check that. So I'm not, you can't use Table 3.1, but I don't want you to think it's completely useless because you can use it as a guide to make sure that your values are correct. So depending upon your loads, you might have a CB value of 1.4, and it's between those two extremes, which is what it should be. That... So did that make sense? I didn't want to go off on too much of a tangent, but I wanted to make sure that was clear. And I apologize if I was hopping back and forth on, on table 3-1. Good deal. In odd loading scenarios, though, you kind of need to do it. Remember, one, one thing that is crystal clear about table 3-1, it is only for simply supported beams. If you have a cantilever or you have, um, you know, an overhanging beam, something like that, this is just not going to work. Say our first trial section is no good. Instead of going up table 310 and selecting solid lines, uh, could we use I men and select a member using the bold rows in table 33? Um, not usually. So um, if you go to table 310, so you're talking about scenarios with high CB values. So you go to table 310, you select your first trial shape, and you find it doesn't work. When the section is no good, um, uh, it's 99 times out of 100 going to be no good because of its moment capacity, not because of deflections. So what you got to do is you got to go to table, or you got to go back to the design chart and, and find the next section. Um, what you can't do is just jump straight to table 3.3. Three. Table 3.3 three, three is only for deflections. Now, let, let's, let's go through this, this process and make sure that we're clear. So you go to the beam chart, you pick a section. Then you go to table 3.2, and you look up its V and P. If it's no good, you go back to table 3.10, pick the next one. And then check the VMP from table 3.2. And so you keep hopping back and forth between table 3.10 and table 3.2 until you find your first section that works. And you're, design, and you're picking based off of moment capacity. 
Now, let's say that you've got a section that's worth analyzing, but it's IX is too small. If it's IX is too small, then abandon all that and go to table 3-3. Three, three. What you're suggesting is go to table 3-3 three, three and pick based off IX before you do all that hopping around. Would it be easier on you as the designer? Yeah, it probably would be. The problem is, is that if you do that, you're going to end up selecting a shape that's most likely too heavy. Um, it'll work, but it'll be too expensive. So you'd be designing a uh, 30 by 90 where I can get by with a W24 by 76. So I'm going to save the owner money and we're both going to be guaranteeing safety. So I'll, so your design, it won't be an issue of your design not being safe. It'll probably be safe, uh, but there's a good chance yours is too expensive. And, and another thing, you, you had mentioned going to table 3-3 three, three and picking a section. You also can't go to table 3-2 and pick a section. There's a chance that you pick a section and it's the lightest one, but there's also a chance it's not the lightest one. Remember, the, the bold rows in table 3-2 don't always correspond to the solid lines in table 3-10. So you kind of have to pick based off table 3-10, hop to table 3-2 and check to see if it works. I know there's a lot of flipping back and forth, and, and that does suck, but after a while, I mean, I'll be honest, after a while, you kind of get used to it, and it, it's, the, it's the best way to go. One of the things that I'll go ahead and tell you since we're talking about it, um, I want to show you all something. This, this is the perfect time to do it. I'm going to show you all something. Give me one second. Um, this, this is, this is, there's a point I want, I want to make, but you all don't, don't let me stop you. If you got questions, please continue to ask, but I want to pull up something. So if you all have questions, please keep on chugging along. Perfect. While, while you all are doing this, I want to show you something. So um, this is, let me share the screen. Th th there's, this is a highly valuable thing to discuss. Um, so if you haven't already done this yet, this is the NCES dashboard. This is um, what you do to, uh, uh, if you want to take your FE exam and your PE exam. So hopefully you all are, are thinking about this because this should be sooner rather than later uh, in your future. And if you look right here, there's a link that says view reference handbooks. And so this is the reference handbook that you get to use on the exam, on the FE exam. And so I went ahead and downloaded that reference book. And I want to share that with everybody here because I want everybody to see the stuff that you get in the reference book. And so, um, all right, so this is the reference handbook and it's a searchable PDF that you get to do or use on the exam. Um, if you uh, go here to the bookmarks, there's all these different sections. I'm going to go to civil engineering. And so if you go to civil engineering, you know, some of the stuff you should recognize from other courses, like here's some geotech, uh, soil uh, phase diagrams and soil properties, uh, consolidation, uh, horizontal stress. Da -da 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 -da. Here's some uh, some more geotech. Here's structural analysis. Um, here's some, you know, deflection formulas that should be pretty familiar, you know. 
um, what have you, structural design, so 1.2 dead, 1.6 live. But then when we get into the steel design section, so this is concrete, this is concrete. So here's steel design. So first off, here's a lot of the formulas that we've been seeing already for yielding, for LTB, uh, for columns. Here's the, the CB table. It's listed right here uh, in the manual. So they give that to you. Uh, but so that you're aware, if you keep going, here's the ZX charts. They actually give you a, the ZX tables in the manual or in, in the F, on the FE. So you actually get to use the ZX tables. They, they look a little different because there's no, um, there's no like green and blue. It's all just blue. But here's your BMPs. Here's your... BFs, your LPs and LRs, all that stuff. Um, if you go here, they even give you a beam chart. They even give you one of these. So, um, so they give you this stuff on the exam as well. So, you, I mean, everything that we're doing here is stuff that you could do uh, on the exam. So they, they give you all of those tools as well. So you would pick a shape here and then check its capacity, pick a shape, check its capacity, and so on and so forth. And so there's a lot of good stuff here. You really ought to check it out. Um, this is table 4.1 for selecting columns. So here's the, you know, the W14, or sorry, here's the W14 shapes. There's the W12 shapes. There's the w, W10 shapes. So all that stuff's there uh, as well. Yeah, please, I don't want to monopolize time. I want to make sure you all uh, are getting your questions answered. There's got to be more. Could you define the CB factor again? Um, hold on. What do you? Could you? Could you help me out with what you mean by define? Because oh, the purpose. Okay, so here's the purpose. Let me give me a sec. That's a fair question. Give me a sec. I'm pulling some notes up. Okay. All right. Let me go to, let me go to this. All right. Okay. So in order to derive, so, so you all remember the flow chart, right? If you have zone one, zone two, zone three, uh, you know, depending upon what your LB, L, LP, LR, all that stuff is to determine the capacity, okay? Well, in order to do that, um, you know, the equations that you're using come from this. They come from solving this equation right here, okay? And, and I'm not trying to turn this into a calculus class. I'm not, I'm not trying to do that. I'm just saying that in order to derive the equations that we use in the manual, we're solving that, okay? Now, in order to solve that equation, in order to come up with a solution to, to that that we can use as engineers, we have to treat the M term as a constant. See how it says M squared over EI times phi equals zero? We have to treat the M term as a constant. So the point is, if you remember, I had shown you something at the very beginning. I said, like, if you if you have to take a derivative and you have, like, a derivative and you're taking the derivative of five times that function, you can just factor that five out because it's a constant. But if you're taking the derivative of x cubed times a function, the x cubed is not a constant. It's a variable. And it, it real quickly makes that derivative a lot more complicated. And I'm not saying it's not impossible. I mean, th this is a an example we can wrap our head around. I'm just saying that whenever your coefficient is a constant, it's a lot easier to deal with than if the coefficient is a variable. Now, this, this right here, this is a simple derivative. This is just x cubed times the sine of x. Everybody who took calc one should be able to take that derivative. What I'm saying is that this derivative is one thing, 
solving this fourth order differential equation is an entirely other matter because it is it is difficult to say the least. If your moment term is not a constant, it gets involved real quick, real quick. So in order to come up with that solution, we treat the moment like it's a constant so that we can come up with something that we can use. See that yellow equation right there? That yellow equation is basically the zone three equation. That's FCR for zone three. It's just rewritten a little bit. But so we have to treat moment as a constant to solve that equation. But the problem is moment isn't a constant. I mean, how many moment diagrams have we ever seen that look like this? That They don't, okay? That moment diagrams go up and down and all over the place. So what the moment gradient modifier does is it accounts for the fact that we made a simplification when we solved the equation. We assumed that the moment is a constant, and it's not. So CB corrects that assumption. That's what CB is doing, is it's correcting our assumption when we came up with the equations in the first place. And so it it's kind of like uh, uh, the slope of your moment diagram. It's not really, but th the best way of thinking about it is we assumed that the moment is constant. CB tells us how wrong that assumption was. So if you have a moment diagram that's going all over the place, you're going to have a high CB value. Did that make sense? Did that answer your question? Okay, good. That's a good question. I, I, I mean, that, keep keep them coming. That, that's great. Uh, that's good stuff. Feel like I'm getting let off easy again. Y'all gotta have some more questions for me. I'll give everybody to, to come up with something. Oh, there's got to be some more. Come on. Remember, columns will be on here, too, so don't forget about that. I think most of our questions that we've had have been about, um, have been about beams.
I'll give everybody another uh, minute or so to see if they have any questions. Um, I tell you what, I, I'm going to uh, cover just a, a few quick logistical items before we close. Uh, again, um, I want to go back. Hold on. Give me one second. Um, so I want to go back to right here. So again, the exam will open up on Tuesday. It'll open up at 10:15 a.m. and it will close at 12:45. Again, I, I'm I'm trying to keep the window uh, as open as possible. I can't uh, open it past that because that dips into the next exam window. But that's two and a half hours for an exam that's designed to be 50 minutes long. So you should have more than enough time uh, to complete the exam. Um, Let's see. Can you go over the, uh, there? We go. Okay. Can you go over the differences and analysis between symmetric and non-symmetric beams? Sure. So, um, let's see. While I'm doing that, while I'm pulling this up, just remember. Um, uh, again, you can use the steel manual. You can use any resource on Blackboard. You can even pull up the old YouTube recordings if you want. Just make sure no, uh, uh, nobody else or you know. That includes like you know resources online stuff like that, but um, I, I think it would probably steer you in the wrong direction anyways. Um, let me let me pull up the the one set of notes that might answer that question best. All right. So. Um, First off, everybody should be familiar with MY over I. Everybody should be good there. Um, I'm not going to make you all compute moments of inertia for this exam. That that was Engineering 216 and stuff like that, so don't worry about that. If I make you compute properties, it'll be limited to ZX and stuff like that, so don't, don't worry about that. Um, let's start off with uh, uh, symmetric sections. So... Uh, symmetric sections, um, what we can say about a symmetric section is that its elastic neutral axis and its plastic neutral axis are in the same spot. Okay. If you look at this image right here, what you see is that the centroid uh, of that section is halfway up from the bottom. And that's the same place that splits this up into two equal areas. Remember, if I if the if I fold if I were to print this I beam off on a sheet of paper and I were to fold about that dashed line I'd get the same shape on top and bottom it would look the same so it's symmetric about that dashed line and that tells us that that's not only where the centroid is but where the plastic neutral axis is um, whenever you're dealing with a non-symmetric section that isn't the case if I skip ahead a little bit um, what you'll see is that um, when you have a non-symmetric section, here's the, the, the shape, right? And so non-symmetric sections, the centroid and the plastic neutral axis are not in the same spot. So you compute the location of the centroid by just doing sum of A, Y over sum of A. And so remember, you reference from a common datum, so we'll say we reference from the bottom. The centroid of that shape is about 13 inches from the bottom. That's where the Y bar is, the centroid. But if you look at the, uh, the plastic neutral axis um, for, for this section, it's not in the, the same spot. Here, here's the slide that summarizes everything. So the centroid is 13.436 inches from the bottom. The plastic neutral axis is 7.6 inches from the bottom. The, the location of the neutral axis changes because you're not asking the same question. The centroid is where Y bar is, where the sum of A, Y over the sum of A is. 
The plastic neutral axis is where the area above equals the area below. And that's not the same spot when it's not symmetric. And this, the numbers show that here. Um, as for other differences, um, a, a couple things. The plastic moment is generally easier to compute and less computationally intensive than the yield moment. So uh, it's, it's actually easier. Um, all you have to do is do the sum of the area times the distance and just multiply by FY, whereas the yield moment, there's a big old process to compute the moment of inertia that you all don't even have to do on the exam. So plastic moments are easier to compute, but also plastic moments are always larger. The, the plastic moment is always higher than the yield moment. The plastic section modulus, ZX, is always higher than the elastic section modulus. If you look here, ZX is 648 and your smallest SX value is 485. You always use the smallest when you're comparing Z and S. Um, let me see. The reason why the yield moment is always less than the plastic moment is because the yield moment is not the maximum capacity. The plastic moment is the maximum capacity. You keep cranking up that, uh, that moment and the beam can withstand moment past yield. Uh, the plastic moment is the maximum moment it can withstand. So the plastic moment is always larger than the yield moment and therefore ZX is always larger than SX. That's probably me going on a rant a bit, but that's, if you want the, the differences, those are the big differences. Any other quick questions before I uh, before we call it? Well, I'm gonna. If anybody has any questions, go ahead and type them in chat. Just a couple things I want to say before we close it out. I mean, this is our last lecture in steel design, uh, and I just want to say I'm I'm really proud of what everybody's been able to accomplish uh, this semester. The um, you all were definitely put through the ringer with uh, with this uh, sudden move to online and engineering courses are challenging enough and having to do this at a distance uh, is is even more challenging. Uh, but you all uh, came through in clutch. Uh, I got to say, um, uh, quite frankly, I think that a lot of other students could learn from your example that you've set. And I'm not talking about just at Marshall. I'm talking about anywhere. I mean, you've displayed a high level of maturity. Uh, you've gotten the work in on time. Um, and, and I'm, I'm just tickled with your, with your, uh, progress. I've been really proud of you, uh, throughout this whole process. Um, uh, so I guess we'll, we'll get, get ready to sort of end it with that. Again, the exam begins Tuesday. Uh, if you all have any questions that you didn't think of, you're more than welcome to send me an email. We can get on teams and chat, something like that, whatever we need to do to, uh, address any, any concerns you have. Uh, exams opens at 10:15, closes at 12:45, but you should have more than enough time to uh, finish it. If you ever have any technical hiccups throughout of that, let me know. Um, anything else before we uh, close it out? All right. Well. Um, Everybody, please stay safe, stay healthy. Um, let me know if you have any questions. Um, I hope everybody has, uh, if I don't hear from uh, I hope everybody has as relaxing a summer as possible, given, given the circumstances. Um, I hope to see everybody back in the fall, um, and, and we'll be in touch with, uh, uh, with whatnot. I'll try and get the exams graded as soon as possible. I, I got fortunate in the pick that my exams are on Monday and Tuesday. I have capstone presentations on Wednesday, so uh, I might be a little delayed in getting them, but I'll get them graded as soon as I can, and I'll post the grades uh, to Blackboard uh, as well. Um, and so that's all I have. Uh, oh, uh, one other thing. If you haven't done your course evals, please do them. We really value that that feedback, and we'd really like to to hear your thoughts on just how things have gone and, uh, and anything that, that you'd improve or change moving forward. That's all I have, everybody. I really appreciate uh, how flexible everybody's been. Uh, I'm really proud of you, uh, and we'll see you on Tuesday for the exam. That's all I got.